Hi, welcome to the first video I'm trying to record in hopes of helping Mrs. Deedee and the other Litlings teachers provide you with some context for Killer Angels. Uh, my name is Mr. Brilla, Maroon Team Social Studies teacher. For those of you who don't have me or don't know me, and let me tell you something, I absolutely love this novel. And I think a big reason I love it so much is because I have background knowledge. Um, if you don't understand it, the book gets very confusing, and, and, and this hopefully will help you out. Um, so let's go through and start talking about some things. First of all, I think it's important to talk about the overall goals of, of both the Union and the Confederacy, the, the, the North and the South, when it comes to the Battle of Gettysburg. Start with the Confederate goals. By this point in the war, 1863, almost every major land battle had been fought on southern soil. Uh, most of these battles were fought in farms, so the crops were being destroyed and, you know, they needed some... They needed some time off, some time to plant their, their, their vegetables and a break from the constant fighting. So Lee decides, hey, one thing I can do is to take the pressure off my farmlands and invade the, invade the North. Robert E. Lee, commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, Confederate commander, decides we're gonna invade the North, right? Ease the stress on the farmland. Also, he takes a look at the politics of the, side, of the time. Anybody who knows 1863 knows that Within a year, there'll be another election in the North, 1864, the election of 1864. And, and to be honest, Lincoln wasn't a favorite to win at this point. Um, Lincoln had a lot of detractors. Uh, Democrats had put up a very famous war hero in their eyes, General McClellan, who was running on, on the idea that maybe this war wasn't winnable. Maybe it was time to end the war. So Lee looks at what's going on, decides he can ease the stress on his farmlands and deliver one last crushing blow to the Union Army. And that, that with this defeat, Lincoln will not be able to be reelected, and the war would come to an end. The Union, on the other hand, had some pretty simple ones. You know, primarily, above all else, their goal was to save Washington, D.C., protect the Capitol. And to this end, you'll notice that their main objective is to stay between Lee's army and the Capitol of Washington, D.C. That way they can't threaten the Capitol itself. Well, who are the big players? Um, you've heard me talk about him a few times, Robert E. Lee. You obviously, you um, actually won't meet him until a little bit later on in, in the book. You haven't, or you didn't meet him until the end of part one. Um, and I want to talk a minute about part one. Um, it's all background, background knowledge, right? You'll meet Harrison, the spy, or as he likes to be called, the scout. Um, like many spies and scouts, they weren't really trusted. Um, this is still a time of honor. Uh, and people felt like being a spy wasn't honorable. Um, so they don't, they don't really trust to the most part. For the most part, they have a difficult time trusting these spies, these scouts. One person who puts his full faith into Harrison and this scout, this spy, is General James Longstreet. Uh, Longstreet is Lee's right-hand man. Um, Longstreet, he's kind of pensive, he's thoughtful, stoic. Uh, and, and more than anything else, he's very defensive-minded. He believes that the key to winning this war is to continually fight defensive battles. Problem with that, Lee starts to think in terms of offense. Lee, um, when he first took command of the Confederate Army, was, was made fun of and harassed ruthlessly for, for, for um, only fighting defensive wars. They called him Granny Lee because he acted too slow, he moved too slow. They called him the King of Spades or Shovels because he, he continually dug entrenchments. And, and many of the people in the South wanted Lee to attack, 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 right? Um, Longstreet did not favor that. And then your final, the final person that you didn't meet but you heard a lot about at this point was Jeb Stewart, who you may have noticed just disappeared because we didn't know where Stewart was at this point. Lee didn't know, Longstreet didn't know. Nobody knew. Stuart, like all cavalry commanders, was invaluable. He was the eyes and the ears for Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet. However, Stuart's a little flashy. He's, he's a little cocky to James Longstreet. Um, he loved to read his name in the northern newspapers. He actually will ride circles around the, the Union Army a few times just to get his name in print. Um, at this point, Lee and Longstreet have no idea where Stuart's cavalry is. Uh, what they're actually doing is pretty good, and we'll talk later about that a little bit later on. All right, so, so you know the Confederate commanders. These guys are pretty big. They're, they're important. You've talked about them. You've met them. Um, they had the whole campfire scene, um, and you're about to see the first day of the battle. And, and one of the big important things is to understand why Gettysburg. Why fight here? Um, you'll hear something about shoes, you know, that the, it's a battle fought over shoes. And uh, to some point, that's true. It's probably more likely that they're fought over supplies. But more than anything else, this battle is fought because, you know, like Rome, 
all roads led to Gettysburg. Now, this is a modern day map of Gettysburg and you can see it's a spider web of roads and highways. 10 major roads, 10 major highways make their way to Gettysburg. It looks like the, the spokes on a tire. So literally what happens is both run into each other. Fighting wasn't planned here, it just happened. So let's take a look at this. Gettysburg on the first day, three day battle, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd. Um, the first day, I think you're about to start reading that soon, or maybe you have started. Um, but literally what happens is the armies will collide outside of the town of Gettysburg. Just to the north and west, there's an unfinished railroad cut uh, where they're building a railroad out along the Cashtown Road up there underneath the G in the map. Um, Henry Heath, or as Lee will call him, Harry, that's his nickname, Harry Heath, Confederate Division, is marching along the Cashtown Pike, and they, they notice what they believe is militia just north of the town of Gettysburg. Um, out by the, the Fairfield Road, just, just west of the uh, Seminary Ridge, up underneath where Heath's picture is. They decide uh, to, to, to make their way forward into the town of Gettysburg, and actually what they run into isn't militia. Instead, it's that guy. It's John Buford and his Federal Cavalry who are dismounted. Uh, cavalry are guys who ride horses. Uh, and, and what Buford does on the first day it's pretty impressive. He's able to use um, his dismounted cavalry and what they have, they, they use something called breech loading rifles. And we'll talk about them later. You'll, you'll hear a whole lot about the different types of rifles and guns. But he's able to hold them off, hold off the Confederate invaders until John Reynolds will arrive on the field with infantry where, where they can kind of prolong this victory or excuse me, prolong this first day of fighting. Now, day one happens much like every you know, major battle to this point. Um, I once had a Gettysburg tour guide tell me Lee was like a uh, football coach, a, a, an NCAA football coach, 4-0-1, heading in for a national title, right? Four major victories, one tie. Some people call it a loss. It's not really a loss, right? But as the day progresses, things unfold at Gettysburg like you would think they would, right? Fighting starts to the north and west of town, and before long, the Union troops start to break, and they start to retreat and run. However, this time it's a little different because what they run to is some pretty darn good land. And they run and they stay on what's called Cemetery Hill. And you can just see, you see just south of town, right? Just south of the, where that Y and the S in Gettysburg meets in the map, you see Cemetery Hill. And Cemetery Hill, although it might not look it, is some of the highest ground on the, the battlefield. And that's important. High ground is very important. So things are a little different. Day one, at the end of day one, things are a little different than what you would normally think. Well. Think about this. Let's take a look real quick at why things were so important. First of all, it's that guy, John Buford. Buford does a tremendous job in slowing the Confederate advance and allowing for a uh, organized retreat, an organized retreat to, to Cemetery Hill. Second thing is, by the time, by the end of day one, that man arrives on the battlefield. And this is Pennsylvania's own General Winfield Scott Hancock. So Hancock comes and he, he decides, like, you know what? This is pretty good land. So rather than continuing to retreat and fall back, he's gonna tell the troops to dig in and fortify and, and stay here at Cemetery Hill and wrapping around, you'll see Cemetery Ridge and Culp's Hill. Right? And lastly is this man, Confederate General uh, Richard Yule. At the end of the first night, Yule gets word from Lee. And Lee tells Yule, if practicable, and that's the exact word, if practicable, take that hill. If you can, if you believe you're able to take the hill, take it. Yule decides he's not really sure what those orders mean and he's not comfortable launching an attack without more specific orders, so he won't. So by the end of day one, things are a little different. And you see here that they start to meet. Each side meets in their headquarters. To the left there is the Confederate headquarters. To the right is the Union headquarters where, where General Meade, who's now in charge, in charge of the, the Union Army, will stay. Well, to the left in, in the... Uh, Confederate headquarters, you know, a couple things, a couple questions. One of the big questions, where's Stuart? They still don't know where Stuart is. They still really don't have any idea of what they're up against. They know that most of the army's there, but they don't know who and, and, and where they are at this point, right? So Lee and Longstreet start to have their debate and their discussion again. And, and Longstreet says to Lee, like, hey, let's swing around. Let's go around, let's go to the south and the east of, of Meade's line, cut off their lines of communication, pick a different place to defend, or different place to fight and make them attack us. We'll fight a defensive battle. Well, on the other side, Meade's headquarters, some of the same discussions being had. Do we stay here and defend this land or do we retreat to a different land of our choosing? The Union will eventually decide we're gonna stick here. It's good land, good high ground, let's stay here. 
Lee and Longstreet continue the discussion into the night where finally Lee says to him, like, listen, General, there's where the army is, and that's where I'm going to destroy him. Uh, Lee considers the attack on the following day to be, quote, in a measure of unavoidable, and the success already gained gave him gave hope for a favorable issue. Right? He said, look, General, they've already ran away from us. They've already run away. They've retreated once. They'll retreat again. That's where the army is. That's where we'll beat him. And you'll see that's where you'll pick up on day two coming soon. The Union on the high ground, the Confederates without Stuart attacking.